Before we start, if you're enjoying these conversations, please make sure that you like or subscribe to Cleaning Up. It really helps other people to find us. Cleaning Up is brought to you by Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation, and the Gilardini Foundation. Hello, I'm Michael Liebreich, and this is Cleaning Up. One company, more than any other, is famous for taking the military approach of using scenarios in their analysis and applying them to the world of business. And that company is Shell. My guest today on Cleaning Up is Laszlo Varro. He's the VP for the Global Business Environment at Shell and responsible for the famous Shell scenarios, now 50 years old. Before that, he was the chief economist at the International Energy Agency. Please join me in welcoming Laszlo Varro to Cleaning Up. So, Laszlo, welcome to Cleaning Up. Thank you very much for the invitation, Michael. So, where are you calling in from today? Are you in Holland, presumably? Yes, uh, this is my working room in our house nearby, nearby The Hague. Very good. Let's do the following to start with. Um, uh, just the audience are incredibly knowledgeable. Um, they don't all know exactly who's doing what within Shell, within the IEA and so on. So why don't you start by giving us a thumbnail bio in your own words, because you are now the, um, the, the VP of Global Business Environment at Shell. What does it mean? So uh, strategy and business environment is the official legal name of the Shell Scenario team, which was established uh, half a century ago to help the decision makers navigating deep uncertainties. So this is a team of uh, 38 professionals from all around the world with professional backgrounds ranging from energy economics to military history, who are reflecting on some of the great, great uncertainties uh, of the global economy, the energy and the climate system. And I joined Shell uh, last September. Before that, I spent a decade at the International Energy Agency, first as the head of gas and electricity markets. And I took up that position on the Monday after Fukushima with a very intense crisis management. And then uh, in 2016, I was appointed as the chief economist of the International Energy Agency. And I had a five-year period uh, as the chief economist of the IEA. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and so uh, these are now your responsibilities uh, cover the famous shell scenarios. As you say, 50 years they've been going, and it was really, I think, the first corporate to take this idea of scenarios out of the military environment and try to apply it to their own competitive landscape. And I want to talk about those, um, those scenarios. But before then, I've got a couple of other things that I think we should cover. I think we should talk about this extraordinary moment in history in the energy sector, but also broadly in the economy and in world history. I think we should talk about those scenarios. And then I want to make sure we have enough time to get on to more general questions around the society's transition, around Shell or other oil and gas companies' role in the transition to net zero and so on. So for me, that would be those three things I'd like to cover. And perhaps we start with the moment in history. Um, how do you see it? So 2022 certainly shaped up as a year when history was teaching us hard lessons about uncertainties. Um, uh, the, uh, the Russian aggression against Ukraine uh, is uh, a moment which is unprecedented since the Second World War. Uh, it is a great human tragedy. But it also triggered an energy crisis, which might well become more serious than the 1970s oil shocks. It is certainly deeper and more serious than anything that happened since the, uh, since the 1970s. And of course, the reason for this is that Russia, for decades, was the largest hydrocarbon exporter in the global economy. Saudi Arabia exports more oil, but Saudi Arabia doesn't export gas. So combined oil and gas, Russia was for decades the largest hydrocarbon exporter. Europe for decades were the large, was the largest hydrocarbon importer. And there were decades of infrastructure and contractual dependency between uh, Europe and Russia. Uh, such a relationship is built on a foundation of trust and the Russian aggression completely destroyed that foundation. Uh, and what we are observing is not simply 
that Russian oil and gas is redirected to Asia. That is happening to some extent, but we see uh, uh, the lack of ability of Russia to redirect all their supplies. So a uh, meaningful amount of Russian oil will stay underground. Uh, it is still a bit uncertain depending on how the sanctions are exactly implemented. And in the case of gas, recent data already shows a decline in Russian gas production, which is bigger than the entire global decline of, glo of gas demand in 2020 with the coronavirus restrictions. So it is a very serious supply shock for the entire global economy, triggering strong spillover effects in the entire energy system. This is an absolutely enormous boulder that has been thrown into the pool of the global energy system. And the, the ripples, the waves are clearly going to bounce for many years, many decades. What would you say? So, so the first thing to keep in mind is that there were tensions in the energy system already on the 23rd of February when the Russian tanks started to move. The coronavirus recovery was very energy intensive. People went out, spent their money, um, consumption shifted to manufactured goods, which was driving up the energy intensity of the global economy. Oil and gas upstream investment adjusted down to the level that would be required in a net zero well below two degrees climate trajectory as the industry adjusted its investment approach to the Paris Agreement, while at the same time, Clean energy investment remained structurally below the level that would in real life successfully put oil and gas demand on a continuously declining path. So this mismatch uh, in investment of oil and gas investment adjusting down to the Paris Agreement, but clean energy investment struggling to ramp up, it already created tensions. Global gas markets especially were already going crazy last December before the war started and uh, started. And then the Russian uh, aggression reinforced those tensions. Can I just interject there just with a question? Um, to what extent was last year's price spike, which was already being called unprecedented, and you've just referred to it as um, the result of underinvestment in clean energy, the bounce back from the COVID pandemic, but there was something else going on, which was um, President Putin already turning the taps down, was it not? And to what extent can we put the blame on the COVID bounce back, the underinvestment, or the preparation, Russia's preparation for its aggression? Yes, so, so certainly, certainly uh, Russia has already started to reduce uh, uh, the uh, gas supplies to Europe. Uh, um, before the war, the dominant interpretation was that this is basically an abuse of dominant power to push European prices high and maximize export revenues. Uh, having said that, the I go, last year, 2021, was a 5.8% increase in global GDP as the economy bounced back after the coronavirus, and a 5.8% increase in global energy consumption with no improvement in the energy intensity of the global economy at all. Now, before the coronavirus, the rule of thumb was 3% global GDP growth, 1% growth of global energy consumption with a 2% improvement of energy intensity. And one of the things I was involved during my uh, IE tenure was the establishment of the 3% club, where like-minded governments came together to accelerate the improvements of the energy intensity of the global economy to further the energy transition. And in 2021, we have seen no improvement in energy intensity yeah. whatsoever. So this, this very robust energy demand in 2021 was certainly part of the combination of factors. And in fact, I was a commissioner on the, uh, the, the commission that went alongside the launch of the 3% Club, um, was the Commission for Urgent Energy Efficiency, um, trying to get this rate of efficiency improvement up to 3%, which I would say at this point, you have to say, has not been a success. So, so 2021, to be fair with the energy efficiency policies, was primarily a structural shift uh, that uh, um, consumer expenditure shifted from services to manufacturing yes. goods. Uh, and uh, uh, that, that was well documented in the macroeconomic literature, but the energy implications were often neglected. Because when a consumer 
buys a new PlayStation on Amazon instead of going to a yoga club, then two things will need, two things will need to happen. One, that gadget is manufactured more often than not in Asia. So last year, the electricity consumption increase in Chinese factories was more than the entire British electricity system. Uh, and then the second is that that gadget has to be transported to the consumer, which is oil. So by February, all the uh, oil demand components of logistics, so container shipping, highway trucking, but even air cargo were way, way above the pre-epidemic level. Right, so we've seen this surge of uh, demand. We've seen um, some element of, uh, of, of Russia turning down the supply in preparation um, and underinvestment, which we've spoken about actually on quite a few of the episodes of cleaning up. And then you get this invasion. And of course, with um, Russian, the sanctions against Russia and then Russia's shutting down the taps itself, we then have a return to burning coal. We have all sorts of, um, uh, and that's not just not just in Europe. We also see a return to burning coal uh, in Asia um, to fuel the the their own um, re-stimulation of the economy and so on. And in response to high gas prices, but my question then would be, how short-lived do you see that return to? fossil growth or to the bounce back in, in use of coal and, and fossil fuels overall? I mean, is this a new normal or is this a couple of years um, bulge because of the short-term pressures? No, it's a very painful but overall temporary phenomenon. Uh, the, uh, we, we certainly observe highly undesirable side effects uh, as, uh, of the gas crisis. You know, the, the European approach has been essentially to outbid everybody else and buy up all the gas. Uh, and perhaps the best example for, for the undesirable side effects is Pakistan, where a European company, I'm proud to say it was not Shell, had a contractual obligation to supply Pakistan with liquefied natural gas. They defaulted on the contract because even after paying the contractual penalties, it was more profitable to bring the mm -hmm. gas to Europe. The, uh, 12 million people in Karachi stuck without electricity when the tankers didn't arrive. Now, Pakistan has five major coal projects in various stages of development, all financed by China, part of the Belt and Road Initiative. And uh, as we have this discussion, the European polit political decision makers are trying to convince the Pakistani prime minister in the climate summit uh, to cancel those coal projects. And, and that is going to be a challenging conversation. So, so there are clearly undesirable side effects. But overall, we see a remarkably green response to the crisis, a regionally divergent response, but a remarkably green response. So we have observed you know, the, the European Union and also the United Kingdom essentially double down on energy uh, transition policies with very strong uh, renewable uh, targets, very strong energy efficiency and hydrogen targets, and also a very open discussion of the necessity to change consumer lifestyle to reduce energy demand. In the US, consumer lifestyle change is not on the political agenda, but the US adopted a historical milestone uh, climate legislation, which we expect to trigger a gold rush of investment into clean energy. And jumping through the Pacific, we also see China investing more into clean energy than Europe and the United States combined. Um, so, so overall, we see a, a remarkably strong political determination to, you, to, to essentially rise to the challenge uh, and manage this crisis in a fashion which will be good in the long term. Uh, and we also see very powerful uh, financial incentives because, of course, uh, very high gas prices feeding into very high electricity prices make the economics of pretty much every clean energy project quite compelling. You know. If you, before the before 2022, before all the events of this year, if you had um, happened perhaps to be in the scenarios business and you were thinking about where the world might be in 2030 in terms of the, um, the shift towards low carbon energy, and if that is, let's say, your kind of uh, datum point, has 2020 um, resulted in that 2030 scenario being cleaner or less clean? So 2030 is only eight years from now. Yes. Um, 
Uh, and, uh, and in 2030, the short and medium term disruption uh, from this, uh, from both from the Russia-Ukraine war and also from the supply chain disruptions uh, that are still the heritage of COVID, in 2030, this will still be visible. So, so basically, the, you know, the, the headline target uh, of 40-45% reduction of global carbon dioxide emissions by 2030, uh, the, it's, it's very challenging to envisage a scenario in which that target is met. Uh, but for 2050, when there is, there is time for investment, there is time for innovation, uh, I believe that the shock uh, of 2022 overall increased the likelihood of the long-term 2050 target being met. I'm um, more optimistic about 2030. So I've written about the, what I call the great clean energy acceleration. I actually, um, uh, a couple of episodes again uh, ago, I read that as a, an audio blog. And so I think we've got two very, very difficult winters, clearly in Europe. But that actually by 2030, although of course the the waves, the ripples from that boulder being thrown into the lake will still be washing around. But I think that by 2030, the trajectory will have tightened uh, because although it's only eight years, but for a lot of investments, um, energy efficiency, a lot of renewable energy, they can actually be done fairly quickly. And of course, rerouting some LNG. So for instance, bringing in the floating um, the, the, the floating storage regasification units, that will be done in Europe. Uh, so I, I think we're going to see a more a quicker adjustment perhaps than you're describing there. So, so, so Michael, I, I agree with what, you, with what you just described. So certainly it is very well conceivable to see the peak of global fossil fuel use and the peak of global carbon dioxide emissions this decade. That's, that's entirely plausible. Uh, if I combine what I see as investments unfolding on the demand side, so things like heat pump deployment or, or uh, solar deployment in Europe, and also on the supply side in new LNG sources, by the second half of the decade, as uh, the, the energy security as uh, concerns will be, in my view, comprehensively addressed uh, if, uh, if uh, so we, we play our cards smartly. But the question is, will we see global carbon dioxide emissions declining not just a little bit by 2030, but by 45%? That, that, is, a, that, that, would, that is a very, very radical target. I guess we're sort of, I suspect we're agreeing because I personally don't think that we were ever on track for 40, 45% reduction during the course of this decade. So I, in fact, in 2019, I wrote a piece called Peak Emissions Are Closer Than You Think, and here's why. This was for Bloomberg. And I postulated that there might be a 5 or 10% decline in emissions from the peak. So I thought that we were about at the peak 2020, 22, 23, 24, and then we would see five to 10% reduction. I, I think we will end up by 2030 with maybe a 15 or 20 percent reduction from the peak in whenever the peak is, whether it's 20, whether it, it's going to be sometime, I believe, before 2025. And I think we'll go down by, let's call it 15 to 20, but not 45. So I agree with you entirely there. Yeah. Now, and this has this has an important mathematical consequence, uh, because basically, basically that means that uh, that a 1.5 carbon budget can be satisfied only with negative emissions and carbon removal. Co correct, which I have again been saying since I think 2017, I've been saying that at some point, we're going to have to come to grips with the fact that we are going through one and a half degrees and we'll go through the one and a half degrees in maybe 2040, maybe even slightly before then. But you know, the fiction that we've somehow kept one and a half degrees alive through anything other than large scale carbon removal which I had a very good um, episode with Julio Friedman of Carbon Direct and uh, formerly the DOE, and uh, I think it's uh, one of the uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, where he thinks that large-scale carbon removal is not a problem and, and probably going to happen, and I think it's not a problem but probably not going to happen for economic reasons. 
So I'm I'm a great admirer of Julio Friedman, and I, he's, a, he's I would consider a, 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 a good friend of mine. Um, uh, Shell, Shell is also doing uh, the original Frontier uh, R&D uh, on both direct air capture and also uh, on capturing carbon dioxide uh, from the ocean, uh, from the surface levels of the ocean. Um, uh, certainly, the thermodynamics is challenging. So capturing, yeah. capturing carbon dioxide from ambient air is, uh, that will always require energy. But there are very promising approaches to improve the energy efficiency of the process. Uh, and there are also very promising approaches to design processes which use low temperature heat as the energy input, uh, from which there is massive quantities of low temperature, low temperature heat, which are essentially wasted and thrown away in various industrial facilities or, uh, or power plants uh, and, and so on. Um, so I would say, so, so I would say that uh, the uh, the carbon removal is certainly a technology area uh, where, where further innovation and further investment is needed. Uh, and it's never going to be a free lunch, um, but it's within, it, it's within the realms of possibility. So if you, if, if you for example, observe uh, how societies react to existential threats. So in terms of raising defense expenditure from 2% of GDP to 3% of GDP, is absolutely politically and socially uncontroversial when a society faces an existential threat. So, so if, if climate change is indeed treated as an existential threat, then uh, your know, direct air capture-based carbon removal is within the range of that interval. Right, and you know, I, I, without relitigating the episode that I did with Julio, essentially I, I, I said, okay, even if you accept that you can do carbon direct air capture for a uh, hundred dollars a ton, and he wants to do two gigatons, so that's two hundred billion dollars per year, more than the current combined aid budget of all of the developed world. When I say it's not a problem, of course we could do that. The physics and the economics uh, can be made to work. The politics, however will only happen if it is seen as an existential threat. There are no co-benefits. There's no cleaner air. There's no, you can argue some jobs, but there's really no co-benefits for direct air uh, capture other than um, mitigating against uh, climate change. No. And therefore it will only happen if it's absolutely clear that the world is going into a substantial immediate crisis. And I think that that's not going to be politically the case until maybe the second half or, or, or possibly even later in the century. Well, uh, the, the, the example that I like to bring up is to, to look at two countries, which are democracies, you know, Israel and South Korea. These are, these are countries where they have defense expenditure per GDP, five to seven percent instead of two uh, in, in other Western democracies. They have compulsory military service, uh, which other democracies abolished 30 years ago. Uh, and if either the Israeli army or the South Korean army wants to build a missile battery on privately owned land, uh, they have legislation in place that mm -hmm. all the licensing and everything is done in six weeks. Uh, and this is because these are societies uh, where there is a clear cross-party consensus that they face an existential threat, which nobody in the political spectrum, uh, spectrum questions. Uh, yeah. So, so basically, so basically, the question is that uh, there is the question is that uh, that uh, will society re react to climate change as if the Western European democracies treat, treat defense policy, or will society react to climate change as Israel and South Korea treats defense policy? Well, exactly. That's a that's a great way of phrasing. And in my view, the answer is that. Um, you know, to get an, I don't know what there is in, in Israel and South Korea, what is the percentage consensus that there is a true and immediate threat worth spending three, four percent extra of your GDP? I suspect that 80 or 90 percent of the population agrees with that. And we are so far from 80 or 90 percent of the population agreeing that there is a climate um, crisis worth spending globally 200 billion dollars a year for no co-benefits. I, I personally, I, I, I'm not waiting to see that for quite a few decades. But let me, let me pull us back here because what we're actually doing 
is starting to talk about scenarios without having yet properly talked about scenarios. So perhaps you can introduce us to the current status of the famous shell scenarios. Uh, what are they and what work are you currently doing on them? So, so basically, so basically so we published the last comprehensive set of shell scenarios in 2021, uh, asking the question, as the world recovers from the coronavirus crisis, what is the key story? What is the key driver? Uh, and there we defined three pathways, three drivers. One, which we called waves. It's not in the order of importance. I just have to start somewhere. Uh, one, which we defined, uh, one, which we called waves, where the key story is consumption and wealth creation. People want to spend money. People, people want to enjoy life. Now, in the wave scenario, the climate targets are breached, even though you know, renewable energy and clean energy technology is doing quite well in the wave scenario. Companies like Tesla are an amazing wealth creation story. But in waves, energy consumption is just simply too high. Uh, and energy consumption, and it's very high energy consumption, even though clean energy is doing really well, there is a gap to be filled by fossil fuels. Uh, 2021 was actually a pretty good description. Uh, of the wave scenario. Uh, then we designed a scenario which is called islands. And this is a deglobalization scenario where the key driver is security. Now, in islands, uh, climate policy also fails, but for a different reason. Energy consumption is lower in the island scenario because deglobalization hits G GDP growth. But the remaining energy consumption is more carbon intensive. Around 30% of global carbon dioxide emissions come from domestic coal. So these are like Chinese coal mined and burned in China or South African coal mined and burned in South Africa, which is a climate policy problem, but a geopolitical security solution. And in a world prioritizing security, it's difficult to get rid of it. Uh, the short-term negative impacts of the Russia-Ukraine war are quite, quite consistent uh, with the island scenario. And then we designed uh, a a normative well below two degrees pathway, which we call Sky. And Sky is a scenario which is primarily driven by priority on health and sustainability. Um, and it is, uh, it is broadly comparable to a number of other uh, well below two degree scenarios that it emphasizes energy efficiency improvements, electrification, renewable deployment, but also low carbon hydrocarbons uh, and carbon capture and storage for the hard to abate sectors. This year, we did a work which we call the plunging to islands, which tried to analyze the short and medium term regionally divergent impacts of the Russia-Ukraine war. And we take the takeaways from this. And next year, we are going to publish an updated cell set of shell scenarios. OK, so you've got waves, which is lots of consumption. You've got islands, which is a failure of international cooperation, more emphasis on competition, and lots more coal. And then you've got the sky, which is the kind of the kumbaya where we'd like to be dealing with climate and other environmental issues, uh, a, a glide path to net zero. But isn't it the fact that we sort of see elements of all three? I mean, we are seeing, despite the war in Ukraine, an enormous um, surge in consumption the bounce back from pandemic. And certainly, you know, I'm sitting here in Notting Hill Gate. If you walk around, you see people, you know, waving away in their cafes and shopping. And uh, you see the delivery vans up and down the street like, like nobody's business. We see islands. We see this descent to competition. Although I want to come back to whether that automatically means coal, because you also talked us through at the beginning a whole list of things, even though... Um, we are seeing a, 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 you know, these global block competition uh, growing. We also see it taking the form of huge investments in clean energy. And then, of course, we still see elements of sky, right? We do see COP27 going on as we speak over in uh, Sharm el-Sheikh. We do see big commitments. We do see um, companies committing very substantially to net zero. The UK, it's a legal requirement. So, I mean... Uh, Aren't, aren't we just going to get a big mi a mix of all three of these scenarios? So, so Michael, in, in general, what we, we, we try to emphasize that 
The different scenarios are not simply just different numbers in a spreadsheet. They are different stories. Uh, and and if this and I'm very glad uh, so that uh, that you mentioned these examples because one of our success criteria precisely is that if the scenario set is well designed, then all of the scenarios will have components which will feel familiar. All of the scenarios which will will, will have components which feel which feel feel plausible. Uh, the is uh, uh, and will be recognized as a possible future pathway. Uh, now, of course. In, in reality, both of these three drivers, consumption, security, sustainability, play a significant role. Um, and, and, and the real world is never a pure play 100% only one. I mean, this is very comforting. And I understand that you, know, you have sort of 34, 38 mouths to feed in your group. Um, and so, you know, the fact that none of the scenarios is going to be the answer is sort of there's a, there's a reason for that. But, you know, if we just take a step back, you know, to what extent did the shell scenarios that this was before your time, did they anticipate the pandemic and help with the management of the pandemic? Did they anticipate the great financial crisis? Did they anticipate Russia's invasion, invasion of Ukraine? I mean, these are the things that throw huge boulders into the sea or into the lake. And I'm going to guess that they were not anticipated in any of your scenarios. So, so the, the uh, around the... Uh around three quarters of the work of the scenario team is not published. Uh, because of course, Shell, Shell is a private corporation subject to very strong financial disclosure requirements. And anything that is published under the Shell logo uh, will have to comply with those financial disclosure requirements. Uh, but in the history of the Shell scenario team, uh, there are some fav famous success stories uh, the biggest one is that the, the Shell scenario analysis did, did highlight the, the, uh, the prospect of the balance of power radically shifting in favor of the oil producer resource, hold, resource holding governments. Now, this, the Shell scenario analysis did not predict that the war between Egypt and, uh, and Israel will be launched exactly at Yom Kippur. That would have been impossible to predict. But the, but the statement that it is just a question of time before the balance of power radically shifts towards the resource for the governments, that was correctly identified and that was one of the historical, uh, historical successes. So, um, uh, so we, do, we do put a lot of emphasis in trying to, trying to analyze potential fissures, potential game changers, and then we regularly re revisit them that okay, this was a dog that didn't bark, because for example, you mentioned a couple of game changers, but for example, year year Y2K turned out to be a non-event, and I still don't know whether that was a real problem or whether that was a conspiracy of IT consultants. Um, uh, so, um, so definitely, uh, so, so definitely, we are very much aware of the fact that history has a track record to be more extreme than the stress test scenarios used uh, for risk management purposes. Uh, so we quite consciously push the boundaries and quite consciously try to think out of the box. But some of those might would be very difficult to publish uh, for a stock market listed company under financial regulations. Huge investment going on. I take the point about you can't publish everything, and you shouldn't. It's not your, not your. Nobody can require you to publish everything, all the work you do. But there's a huge investment in waves, islands, and sky. So presumably, you see those uh, that examining those different worlds as the most important thing that you can do with this group. And yet, I would ask, you know, to what extent. Are you looking at, for instance, if China invades Taiwan, that is not a small thing. Given Taiwan's role in chip manufacturing, you have to assume if that happens for five or even 10 years, there will be, I don't want to say no washing machines and no cars, but dramatically, there will be a dramatic recession lasting a decade, a dramatic recession at the very least. And that seems pretty important to look at more than whether there's this theoretical island, theoretical waves, the, theoret the, where the reality has got elements of both, as we've already talked yeah. about. Sure. So basically, our, our methodology on this is that we identify signals and signposts. 
Uh, and then the other answer is okay, this is a signpost which 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 points towards the wave scenario. This is a signpost which turns towards the sky scenario. So, so when you observe, for example, that the United Kingdom had a quite colorful domestic politics, uh, uh, Boris Johnson himself was called the British Trump, but, uh, but during that colorful domestic politics period, the United Kingdom maintained a pretty robust, pretty strong net zero policy, and the United Kingdom was an offshore wind success story during that period. Uh, that's a very strong indication uh, towards sky as uh, the, so you would say that instead of a one third, one third, one third combination, now you envisage a 40% sky because there is an important signpost turning in that direction. Of course, the Russia-Ukraine war was a very brutal, uh, very sad reminder that islands is still important but also the discussions about China's role in the clean energy value chains. As, uh, because another thing that we identified in the island scenario as a negative side effect is that uh, you know, clean energy is a winner of globalization. Uh, a, a, a typical wind turbine has components on average from 32 different countries, whereas in the case of both solar panels and also uh, electric car batteries, China's role is indispensable. So, so in the world of deglobalization, increasing geopolitical tensions, decoupling between China and the West, in such a scenario, scaling up clean energy is slower and more expensive than it normally would be. Um, so, we, so, so, we, so, so when we finish the scenario analysis, we don't say that, okay, this is done now, two years of holiday for everybody before we do the next ones, but very consciously analyze and look at what's happening in the world and try to put that into the scenario radar screen and basically saying that, well, these are components that are moving in this direction or that direction. And one of the interesting things that we learned this year, that the, the, uh, you know, the island scenario was designed before the Russia-Ukraine war. Now, what we learned after the Russia-Ukraine war is that overall the response is greener and has more emphasis on renewables than what the original edition of the island scenario predicted. And this year's work was to modify the analytical framework accordingly. Last week, um, uh, as we record this, it has not yet aired, but um, when this airs, it will be last week, uh, we had um, Nobuo Tanaka, Tanaka-san, who was the, your former yep. boss at the International Energy Agency, Director General. Uh, and we talked about how we're seeing this resurgence of competition, so perhaps island-like competition between EU, the EU with its fit for 55 and repower EU policies and having to get off Russian gas. And then you've got the US with its Inflation Reduction Act. You've got China with these huge renewable energy targets, Japan with its green transformation, a trillion dollar program, India with its uh, targets. And so we're actually seeing green competition. And the question I asked him was whether, whether that green competition might not do more for the transition over the next 20 years than green diplomacy did over the last 20 years. That's, uh, that, that is a very interesting, that is a very interesting uh, question, which we are analyzing also, also carefully. It is, certainly, it is certainly true that you know, in the case of China, which has by far the largest clean energy manufacturing uh, in industry in the world, um, this is very much seen as part of industrial policy. So clean, te clean technology is identified as one of the key future industrial areas, and there's a very strong desire for China to have a strong role in them. And, and this is 100% official on the record Chinese policy documents discuss this. Now, uh, also, there is a very open discussion uh, in the United States uh, about restarting domestic manufacturing. It is an interesting, of course, hypothetical what if question. Would it have been politically possible to pass such an ambitious climate legislation in the United States without a very strong domestic manufacturing component? Many American political analysts believe the answer to be no. Uh, uh, and many political analysts believe that this was a very smart political tactics uh, by, the, uh, uh, by the Biden administration. But of course, the European Union is already on the record as uh, uh, claiming that those American manufacturing uh, 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 subsidies are uh, in contrary to the WTO 
as uh, WT roles. So it is possible uh, that clean energy technology might end up like space technology was in the 20th century in the 1960s, when fantastic scientific and engineering achievements were driven, not because of competition, but exactly because of, uh, because of the lack of cooperation, uh, as, as space technology was at the focus of the superpower rivalry. Uh, there is such a possibility for that. Now, if that leads to, let's say, Europe and, uh, uh, and the United States ramping up domestic clean energy manufacturing, and China exporting solar panels and batteries into Africa and Southeast Asia, then it's a net positive for the for the energy transition. But where I do, where I have where I have concerns is uh, that last year was an interesting milestone that. Uh, in, within the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, the clean energy component uh, reached more than 50%. So more than half of the Belt and Road energy investment is now zero carbon investment, solar, batteries, electricity, hydropower, and so on. Now, if a Chinese built solar project in Zambia is regarded as a national security risk by the major Western countries, I don't think that's useful. Uh, so the uh, so, so the Europe and the United States doing their homework on ramping up their value chains, that's a good thing. But overall, this massive scale up of clean energy, which is needed globally, is difficult to see how this could happen without China's capabilities. This is a fantastic um, PhD thesis, or maybe a document from your group, whether having big block competition drives the costs down more quickly than by having global supply chains. As a member of the UK Board of Trade, I certainly would be very interested to read that uh, piece of analysis, no question. Now, if we could just move on to some of the general questions around the sort of role of um, oil and gas majors and uh, the transition to uh, clean energy, to net zero. You mentioned that China, 50% of the Belt and Road investments were clean investments. Can I ask, what is the current percentage of Shell's capital investment that's going into clean versus fossil um, technologies? So uh, our preferred metric is combining uh, uh, capital investment with operating uh, expenditure because the fossil fuel projects and the renewable projects might have very different uh, uh, cost characteristics in terms of capital and uh, uh, and operating is uh, operating expenditures. So, for for example, there's a very strong investor appetite uh, for wind and solar projects that have long-term contracts. So, consequently, Shell has several times more wind and solar in our portfolio than what is our equity ownership, because we routinely go in in partnerships with uh, 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 with uh, institutional investors into renewable projects. Uh, and when we have a power purchase agreement buying the wind, pro wind production or solar production from such a project, then that's accounted as operating its expenditure rather than capital expenditure. So with that, with that came out, we, we have overall around one third of the expenditure uh, so is zero carbon, and the current financial framework will bring it up to half uh, in the middle of the decade. So in, 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 in numerical terms, Shell has a, has a, a, a capital budget of, uh, of 25 to 27 billion uh, billion dollars, of which uh, uh, upstream is eight, uh, inter the integrated gas is four, um, wind and solar is around four, but all the electric car charging investment is accounted as part of the retail business. All the bioenergy investment, biofuel investment is counted as part of the refining business, and all the hydrogen and carbon capture investment is accounted as part of the integrated gas investment. So the headline number for wind and solar is only a component of the zero carbon investments. Okay, but now, um, so just the, the headline figure, if I've understood correctly, is something around 70% is still going into legacy businesses. Is that what I heard? That's, uh, the, uh, in terms of expenditure, that's correct. Okay, but if you look at the energy sector as a whole, there's about, $2 trillion a year invested in everything, oil, gas, uh, coal, electrical system, et cetera, setting aside actually energy efficiency. Um, but the if you take the 
renewables, nuclear, and the grid, which is broadly speaking, most of the future, and there'll be some, CC, you can add CCS in, frankly, because the numbers are still so small, then that is something uh, already around more than a half with fossil investment now, which is down to about sort of 800 billion, is now down to about 40%. So something like 60% is going into clean and 40% into fossil. Shell is doing 70% into legacy, 30% into clean. That mathematically must mean that you're still falling further behind the overall energy sector. So uh, we are very conscious to define where Shell can play a role. So I go, for example, you, you mentioned electricity networks, which is no doubt uh, is, uh, a, a, key, a, a key area of clean energy investment. Uh, the energy system analysis is absolutely clear about that. But we made a very conscious decision. Shell is not going to invest in electricity networks. Uh, on the conventional side, the current uh, oil and gas investment budget is around half of what it was at its peak a couple of years ago. That was a very painful process uh, to, to adjust it down. The largest fossil fuel project that Shell is involved with is Canada LNG, uh, which is going to be geopolitically secure gas supply from a stable and friendly democracy. Uh, and the carbon intensity of the liquefaction process is going to be 35% better than the second best project in the world. So, so we, are, we are quite comfortable we are quite comfortable that the remaining oil and gas activities are, are very resilient to a transition trajectory. Now, where, we have, you have a, where you have an absolutely legitimate point is that there is no doubt that we need to scale up our clean energy investment activities, and we have a very strong strategic uh, objective and a very, a very intense activity to do so. There will be people listen to the, listening to this who will be jumping up and down at this point saying the IEA has said no new investment in oil and gas if we're to stick within one and a half degrees. Now, I know that that's not exactly what the IEA said, but it's not a million miles from it, is it? No, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's the, the, there is no doubt that for a value of two degrees trajectory, you don't need to increase oil and gas investment from the current level. And by the way, that's a very important statement. So, but hang on, no, the, the IEA actually said that you don't need to develop any new fields beyond the ones that were under consideration in 2021. They didn't say you don't increase investment. They so actually they, said you decrease it very substantially. So I guess, uh, I'm, in, as, as I'm, I'm, I'm very proud. I'm very proud that I had a chance to contribute uh, to that historical uh, uh, to that historical report. So I'm, I'm very familiar with the modeling and the analysis behind it. Uh, the the IE Net Zero Roadmap identified around 400 milestones. These uh, is, uh, investment milestones like 100 new nuclear power plants being built by 2030, policy milestones like $110 per ton federal carbon price in the United States, and behavioral milestones like people voluntarily tuning down the air conditioner in their cars to save energy. If all the 400 milestones successfully met, then the consequence of that is the, is the oil and gas investment, uh, investment message. But stopping oil and gas investment was not part of that 400 milestones. The, now, I have an impression that some people who tweeted about the IE Net Zero Roadmap didn't actually read uh, the technical analysis before tweeting it. As, uh, uh, but the, but uh, the Subsequent IE research, the investment report, the new World Energy Outlook, has been quite clear that the current level of oil and gas investment after the brutal investment cuts that unfolded in the past couple of years is pretty well in line what it should happen in a net zero trajectory. And I can tell you that very, very, very powerful political decision makers are putting pressure on the industry to, to invest more and produce more fossil fuels. And, and so in this respect, I think the IE coming very clearly on the record and very clearly outlining the type of oil and gas investment which is consistent in the net zero trajectory is a very important public policy service. Saying that there's these 400 milestones, 
And if those milestones are met, then you do not need new investment. I mean, it sounds marvelous, but isn't it essentially saying that don't look at us, right? It's saying, let, you know, if people stopped flying, if people insulated their homes, if people went to heat pumps, if people used electric cars, if, 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 then we would stop investing. But meanwhile, don't blame us for investing. Is that, I mean, isn't that just a, a restatement of, of, that, of the same position? Well, the the I go, the oil and gas investment in dollar terms globally is almost exactly what the IE estimated to be the oil and gas investment need of the net zero trajectory. The now on your question uh, we we do we very much think that the industry has joint responsibility for the consumers. So our energy our entire energy investment strategy is is emphasizing the philosophy of consumer backed. So for example, take an example of, of light duty transport. If you as a consumer, if you cannot buy an electric car because there is no proper charging infrastructure, that was our responsibility and we own it. And right now our mobility business is deploying an electric car charger in every 20 minutes on average. If there is not enough renewable electricity in the grid, so you end up driving your electric, electric car on coal-fired electricity, that's also our responsibility and we own it. And, and Shell this year is going to be more than 1% of the total global wind and solar investment, uh, which is not so bad. As, uh, uh, but, we also think, uh, but we also think that if there is a consumer who comes to a Shell station with a gasoline car, maybe that consumer just, is just too lazy to ride their bicycle, or maybe that consumer needs to take a sick child to hospital. And we, we don't think that it's our responsibility to tell one consumer that you get gasoline and tell the other consumer that you, you do not get gasoline. So, the, uh, so, so we, very much, we very much believe that we have a responsibility and we are engaging with consumers sector by sector, industry by industry, uh, you know, telling the logistical companies that we love to have you as a client, but we want to stop uh, in the future selling diesel fuel. So let's see what we can do on electric trucks. Well, let's see what we can do on hydrogen, what we can do on biomethane, what would be the good solution for your industry, for your company. Um, but we, we also think that up until you have 100 million people heating their home with natural gas in Europe, it is not, it is not responsible to shut down gas supply for them. Right. And just to be clear, um, I had um, Bill McKibben, it's actually an episode that, to be honest, I don't think nearly enough people have listened to. Bill McKibben, the father of the divestment uh, um, movement. And I challenged him very hard on this idea that the number one responsibility for the climate uh, crisis is the oil and gas companies. Uh, he was adamant that they were. And his number one requirement was stop investing and essentially shut down production. And I asked him if he bore any responsibility, if he if he feels any responsibility for the price spike and the terrible hardship that's being invested on 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 really vulnerable people around the world. And the answer effectively was none. And um, and that so I gave him just as hard a time as I uh, have been giving you just now. Oh, and 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 and, uh, and uh, so, uh, Michael, I think your challenge was absolutely fair. I do think that the industry has responsibility. As, uh, to help consumers decarbonizing and be very strongly emphasized yeah. this consumer back principle. Uh, but we also, we also think, you know, last winter, the UK government assigned half a million British families to Shell as, uh, because their supplier went bankrupt uh, during the recent uh, 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 market volatility. Uh, I, I don't think it would have been appropriate for us to tell the British government that we refused, refused to supply half a million British families. Uh, I don't think that would have been a responsible behavior. Uh, so, although, although you could tell the British government that you don't want to develop new uh, fields in the North Sea. Well, uh, we, 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 we could. We could. And, and I could. our current oil and gas production, if you look at uh, our quarterly reports, is 23% below where it was in 2019. Now, global oil and gas demand is roughly as much as it was in 2019. And since the Paris Agreement was signed, Shell sold $80 billion worth of oil and gas assets uh, as we were fine tuning our portfolio to, to the Paris Agreement. Uh, and the primary result of that was that an ever increasing proportion of the global fossil fuel production is controlled 
by various state-owned entities, private equity investors, uh, uh, so non-listed entities. Um, you know, the type of enti- the, 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 the type of companies where uh, 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 where you might have less commitment uh, to uh, to decarbonization. But, but the- that raises another challenge, though, because um, we had Dev Sanyal, who's now the CEO of Varro Energy, and um, He was formerly a BP executive on the executive committee for many years. And at Varro, he is managing that organization. It's an oil and gas company midstream and downstream. And he is managing it to net zero scopes one, two, and three by 2040 without selling assets. He thinks that selling assets so that somebody else runs them and produces the emissions and you look good is not acceptable. We, uh, we very much share the skepticism about divestment, but we observe, I, I, would, like to comp- I would like to comment on the, the, the strategy of other companies. Um, uh, any any uh, conventional energy company listed on a Western stock market is under a tremendous pressure to divest. Uh, the uh, social pressure, NGO pressure, ESG, sustainable investors, and so on, and we have been, we very much agree that Shell selling assets does not solve any problem. In fact, uh, in fact, at Shell, we have a corporate level 0.2% metal leakage target. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that we are on track achieving that. The global average is 1.5. Uh, so, uh, so in terms of managing the assets responsibly, uh, so there is a very strong track record that we are significantly better than the global average. Laszlo, I promised to get you out at the top of the hour. We've gone a few minutes over. We are, uh, as always, when you and I meet, I think we have a very robust discussion, a very good discussion, a very enjoyable discussion, and I could certainly continue for longer. But I'm afraid we are out of time. Um, I will thank you for your good humor. You know, I pose these questions in a challenging way because I think that that's uh, helpful for the audience and the audience usually comments and say that they're glad that I asked the slightly difficult question. So I hope you don't mind that. And it's been an enormous privilege having you here today. Thank you very much for the invitation. Well, you have a good day. And um, I look forward to the next time that you and I can meet uh, in person. Thank you. Thank you. So that was Laszlo Varro former chief economist at the IEA, International Energy Agency, and now vice president for the global business environment at Shell, responsible for Shell's famous energy scenarios. My guest next week on Cleaning Up is Professor David Seabon. He's a professor of engineering at Cambridge University, a specialist on freight, road transport, other parts of the energy system, and a founder of the Hydrogen Science Coalition. So please join me at this time next week for a conversation with Professor David Seabon. Cleaning Up is brought to you by Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation, and the Gilardini Foundation.